one. Exam practice. Listening. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Centre for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre. Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost £15 a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laverton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to friends of the art centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great! Do you ever offer discounts to friends of the centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all, though obviously we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. 
If we offered a free tour of the art centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students about preparing a questionnaire as part of an essay assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. I've never written an essay of more than 1,500 words before, Anne. Me neither, Mark, and it scares me. Ah, I wouldn't worry. We'll just have to pretend it's four essays of 1,500 words and join them together. <laughs> It says here in the assignment notes Dr Brightwell gave us that we're to write between 5,000 and 6,000 words on some aspect of students' attitudes, backed up by our own research, which we present in the form of tables, graphs, charts or whatever, and supported by reference to the list of books she gave us. Oh, I didn't realise there had been so many social science books written about students. Oh, yeah. There are a lot. Mm. And the questionnaire? Yes. Um, we have to um, prepare a questionnaire to gather our own data for the graphs, etc. And hand it in to Dr Brightwell in draft form in um, two weeks' time. Two weeks? That's what she said, and what it says here. She says that it's better to have it checked before we go on to collect the information and start the writing. Mm, suppose she's right. We'd better get started then. But she didn't say how we were going to put the questionnaire together. Does it say anything in the notes? Uh, nope. It only says that we are limited to four sides of A4 and no more than 50 questions. Mm, mm, if that's the case... It's not that bad. Before you hear the rest of the programme, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. So, how are we going to do it? Well, first we need to know who we're aiming it at. Then decide how many questions we're going to ask. I think we could have about 40 questions maximum. I don't think there's any real need to go up to the 50 limit. Mm. And I think we should keep the questions themselves very simple. <laughs> don't worry. In my case, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a mixture of question types, like multiple choice questions. Yes, no, and agree, disagree, with boxes for people to tick. Mm -hmm. If people are asked to write down anything, it's unlikely they will fill it in. So, are we going to give this questionnaire out to people to hand in, 
or are we going to just stop and ask them around the campus or on the street?、Mm, I don't really know. Did she say anything about this? Um, no, she didn't. And there is nothing in these notes she gave us either. I think we ought to give them out. Okay. Anyway, it won't affect the way we design the questionnaire. We're both doing it on different subjects, but there's nothing wrong with pooling our ideas about the mechanism of the questionnaire. No, none. What are you doing your project on? I've been thinking about doing something around the subject of、um, how aware students are of world affairs. People think that we're all up to date, but I very much doubt it. <laughs> It would also be interesting to compare students in different years, and you. I'm doing something on health and sport, and whether students are more or less active since they came to university. Ah,、oh, sounds interesting. As the questionnaires can be anonymous, I'll fill in your first questionnaire for you. <laughs> But I'm sure you won't be surprised by my answers. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think so. <laughs> I suggest we put together about twenty or twenty-five questions each, and then meet tomorrow or the day after and compare them.、Mm -hmm. Are you going to type yours up? Yeah, then I can come round to your place and we can work on them. You've got a laptop, haven't you? Yes, and I've got some new design software, so we can play around with the layout. Brilliant. Are you any good at doing charts and things? I know how to do simple things on the computer, but we'll sort something out. Okay, I feel much better about all this now. It doesn't seem quite as bad as I first thought. No, don't worry, we'll get it done. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Richard Murray, a zoologist and popular TV personality, has been giving a talk on endangered species of wildlife to members of the Young Conservationists Association in a small town in the south of England. Listen to the extract from the discussion he had with two of the young people after his talk. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. What would you say, Mr. Murray, are the main reasons that so much of our wildlife will have died out by the end of the next few decades? Well, Tony, we can't, of course, rule out the effect of urbanisation due to the spread of population. But apart from that, I believe there are two reasons which. In a way, are like the opposite ends of a piece of string. If you tie a knot in that piece of string, you end up with a circle, and whichever way you go round, it's going to turn out to be the same. I don't think I quite get that, Mr. Murray. Well, let's put it another way. It's rather like a film. You've got the good guys and the bad guys. They're pulling in opposite directions, but when it comes to the final showdown. It's hard to make out which is which. What are your two reasons, Mr. Murray? I call them greed and caring. Greed and caring? Yes, I know they don't seem to have much to do with one another, but think about it. The motive of greed is pretty obvious. In the course of the next few months, thousands of baby seals will be bludgeoned to death before they're even weaned from their mothers. What for? For the sale of their skins at inflated prices to please the vanity of a few, and line the pockets of the killers. Crocodiles will be slaughtered to provide shoes and handbags for the rich. 
Grillers, tigers, leopards and rhinos will be hunted for senseless sport or poached in defiance of regulations. Their skins, their horns and their magnificent heads will be used as trophies to decorate someone's living room floor or walls. That's terrible. Yes, but it's not all. The whale, probably the most impressive and certainly one of the most intelligent sea mammals in creation, will be cruelly hunted and harpooned to make more money for the profiteers. The dolphin, the sailor's friend, will be indiscriminately battered to death at so much a head on the grounds that it is taking away the livelihood of a few fishermen by consuming the fish in its natural habitat. But surely, Mr. Murray, we do have to keep warm. We need whale oil and ambergris. Fishermen have to make a living. Part of what you say is true, of course, Tony, but we shall have to enforce far stricter controls if future generations are not to find themselves in a world devoid of wildlife as we know it. Well, I see what you mean about fur coats and crocodile handbags, Mr. Murray, but I don't understand what you mean by caring. That can't be bad, surely. I mean, I thought we were supposed to be living in a caring society. Well, so we do, in a way. The trouble is, there are so many well-intentioned people who start out with the best possible motives of trying to protect or immunize us from this, that or the other in the most effective way at the quickest possible rate. But in their enthusiasm, they lose sight of the long-term consequences. It's only very gradually that the danger to other forms of life, including humans, comes out. Not to say leaks out, and by that time it'll probably be too late to do much about it. Take insecticides, for instance. But insect... Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But insecticides protect crops from pets. They destroy disease-carrying mites and creepy crawlies like cockroaches. True, but nature has a way of developing her own immunity against insecticides and other pest controls, with the result that the biologists are driven to inventing stronger and stronger compounds, which though they may annihilate the pest, nevertheless permeate the environment, are assimilated by plant and animal life, and become absorbed by the soil. Countless innocent creatures, the beaver or the mole, for example, are performing a useful task in the natural control. The alarming prospect is that as these poisons enter the foods we eat, and consequently our own systems, They'll find their way into the body of the pregnant mother and into her milk, offering incalculable risks to the unborn or newly born infant. In spite of all our technological expertise, our time is running out. We're virtually destroying ourselves. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today we're continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. On the back of the growth in social media, a model of raising finance has emerged known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro-lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding, individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro-lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Crowdfunding portals, or websites, allow the business concerned to present the initiative along with the financial target required. There's a fixed time limit for fundraising, and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book, an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small, set donation, the donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film, whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits. For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people, each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organisations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organisations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed, thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target, or that the initiative failed. Fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company or have a small social media footprint, 
raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.